Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Learning with Human Kinetics. My name is Aaron and today we're going to talk about caffeine. So go ahead and grab your coffee, your green tea, your cold brew, uh, and get ready to learn how caffeine affects your body and how it might impact sport or exercise performance. Caffeine is one of the most recognized, available, and used drugs in the world. You heard me correctly. Caffeine is considered by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to be both a food additive and a drug. In the United States, adults consume an average of 135 milligrams of caffeine daily, which is equivalent to about one and a half cups of coffee. The FDA considers 400 milligrams a safe amount of caffeine for healthy adults to consume daily. Uh, if you're like most people, uh, one of the first things you do upon waking up in the morning is you go and get your first dose of caffeine, whether that is from you know, tea, coffee, an energy drink, or another source. The United States isn't alone. In fact, the United States ranks 25th on the list of coffee consuming nations in the world, and that might surprise some of you. Finland tops the list at uh, 26 and a half pounds per person per year, uh, followed by Norway, Iceland, Denmark, and Netherlands to round out the top five. Now, caffeine can be traced uh, back in history as early as the Stone Age, uh, when people found an energy boost from eating certain plants. The preparation of coffee beans started in the Middle East in the 1400s, made its way to Europe around the 1600s, and eventually to America in the 1700s. It wasn't until the late 1800s when Coca-Cola de was developed in Atlanta, Georgia, and about 10 years later, Pepsi entered the market based in New Bern, North Carolina. Uh, but those products weren't the ones we know of today. We think of those as you know, recreational or casual drinks that we drink on a daily basis. When Coca-Cola first launched, its two ingredients uh, were cocaine and caffeine. It was intended to be used as medicine. Now, competitive athletes liked the taste and noticed the spark they got from drinking it, and in the 1900s started mixing pre-competition cocktails that included things like uh, caffeine, cocaine, ether, and heroin. I guess you could say that was the first pre-workout. It sounds almost uh, unimaginable that it would even be illegal uh, and it definitely wouldn't be illegal in today's world, but that's how they got their boost, and it was accepted. That continued until about 1920, when heroin and cocaine became uh, prescription-only substances, and sport organizations began to develop anti-doping policies. So the idea of using caffeine as a stimulant, whether it is for daily personal use to wake up in the morning or stay alert at work, or as a performance enhancer, isn't new. And the quest to find out exactly how it helps enhance performance isn't new either. The earliest published studies uh, researching the influence of caffeine came in the early 1900s at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. Uh, the research continued, notably at Northwestern University in the 1940s and at Emory University where they studied the influence of caffeine on swimming performance. That particular study had subjects in just 250 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, surprisingly, that study produced results that led researchers to believe that caffeine had no significant impact on performance. Now, I'll get to uh, the effects of caffeine on performance in a little bit, but an interesting question is how exactly caffeine works. Now, when it's consumed, it appears in the blood fairly rapidly uh, within about 30 to 90 minutes. It's then uh, metabolized in the liver uh, with a half-life of about three and a half to five hours. So that means that about half the caffeine is still in your system after three and a half to five hours. In the following three and a half to five hours, another half is gone, leaving about 25% of the original caffeine in your system. That means that as it slowly breaks down, it's possible to still have traces in your blood 24 hours after you initially ingest it. Now, some chemicals found in foods can affect uh, the activity of liver enzymes, and there could be some variability uh, from genetics, causing people to respond differently to the same dose of caffeine. For example, if two people ingest 200 milligrams of caffeine, they might respond differently, and one person might have high concentrations lingering in the bloodstream longer uh, than someone who might break it down more quickly. I have a colleague and a fellow trainer who uh, can tolerate only a small cup of coffee in the morning and then he can't have any more caffeine throughout the day. He'll be wired and have uh, lots of side effects that some people get when they consume caffeine. I, on the other hand, um, I could drink a, a cold brew at 2 or 3 p.m. and still get to sleep just fine that same night. 
Now, the most common way uh, caffeine exerts its effects on the body is the way it impacts adenosine receptors. Adenosine is a neurotransmitter that can do things like promote sleep or a person's need for sleep. Uh, it can reduce heart rate and lower blood pressure. When caffeine enters the system at large enough doses, it blocks adenosine from doing its job, essentially helping us stay alert and awake, uh, giving us the feeling of increased energy. So caffeine alone doesn't necessarily give us energy, and I think that's a misconception, um, probably one of the biggest misconceptions about caffeine. What it does is it prevents us from getting fatigued. Uh, this is referred to as adenosine antagonism. Another way to think of this is imagine having a broken bone or a torn muscle. Uh, you can take some sort of pain relief medicine to get rid of the pain, but it doesn't fix the problem. The pain reliever isn't going to magically repair the bone or muscle. And likewise, caffeine won't help you instantly catch up on sleep or rest, but it will delay your body and your mind from feeling tired and fatigued. Now, caffeine is a number of things, but notably, it is a central nervous system stimulant that causes wakefulness and alertness, as well as improved mood. Uh, the brain has a high number of adenosine receptors, so it is generally accepted that caffeine causes the increase in neurotransmitters through the adenosine antagonism effect. Um, following a study in 2002, researchers concluded that uh, the brain may be more sensitive to caffeine when it's already fatigued. So when we're tired from uh, you know, working or studying for long periods of time, we go to caffeine as a source to help us wake up and become more alert. And since we're already struggling uh, to stay awake, the caffeine has an even bigger impact on us. Now, when we need it most, where can we get caffeine? Or maybe the question should be, where do you get your caffeine? Uh, like I mentioned a couple minutes ago, caffeine can be consumed in energy drinks, uh, sweets, gums, gels, uh, dietary supplements, and even nasal sprays. All forms will have varying uh, amounts of caffeine. Uh, for example, a standard brewed uh, cup of coffee has about 80 milligrams of caffeine. On the high end, a venti uh, breakfast blend from Starbucks has about 415 milligrams of caffeine. Green tea will have around 50 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, a can of Coca-Cola has about 43 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, Monster Energy is right around that 160 milligram mark, and Bang uh, has as much as 300 milligrams per can. Now, that's only a small list and doesn't account for the countless pre-workout supplements uh, on the market. And most of those, as you probably know, will come in uh, you know, liquid form or in a powder form. Now, one of the sources of caffeine I listed was dietary supplements. According to the National Institutes of Health, approximately 15% of U.S. adults have used a weight loss dietary supplement in pill form or at some point in their lives. Um, Americans spend about $2.1 billion per year on weight loss dietary supplements. Now, most of these are advertised as fat burners, and the question is, do they actually work? Now, the body uses energy from a mixture of fuel sources, specifically uh, from its fat and carbohydrate stores. The availability of fuel uh, by body fat stored as adipose tissue is regulated by the rate uh, that fat is broken down to release fatty acids into the bloodstream. Now, in some people, caffeine leads to an increased breakdown of adipose tissue and an accumulation of fatty acids in the blood. But caffeine doesn't increase levels of fatty acids in everyone. As with most things, uh, the results vary quite a bit from person to person. Now, if caffeine could uh, increase fat utilization during exercise, it would allow glycogen stores to be used at a slower rate and be available um, at the end of longer exercise sessions. Uh, while this was once thought to be true, in the mid-1990s, evidence began to surface that glycogen sparing wasn't a major mechanism behind the effects of caffeine. Research has concluded that the effect is gone after about 10 minutes of exercise. A meta-analysis on caffeine's effect on metabolism, or fat metabolism concluded that based on 94 studies with variable findings regarding fat metabolism uh, after ingesting caffeine, both uh, while resting and during exercise, there's a small effect of caffeine to increase fat metabolism, uh, though diet and exercise is always encouraged uh, for overall health, fitness, and wellness uh, benefits long term. So what effect does caffeine have on muscles? Uh, the likely way it would be able to benefit muscle, muscle contraction is through an increased release of calcium inside the muscle cell. 
Now this triggers, triggers the muscle to contract and produce force. One of the reasons we uh, tend to fatigue during exercise or while playing sports is because of the gradual decline in the amount of calcium that is released every time we uh, want to contract our muscles. Unfortunately, the amount of caffeine needed to have uh, this effect would be extremely high and much higher than the highest blood caffeine levels um, ever seen in humans. So while caffeine does have the ability uh, to limit or delay fatigue in muscles, the impact simply isn't large enough to be relied on. Uh, but what about caffeine's impact on sports performance? Uh, the research might surprise some people. Most studies use about three uh, milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight to be an acceptable dose with uh, five to six milligrams uh, of caffeine per kilogram of body weight considered a moderate to high dose. For context, that would be about 252 milligrams of caffeine on the low end and between 420 and 500 milligrams of caffeine in the moderate to high dose for a 185 pound athlete. Now, uh, when looking at any aspect of training or preparation for an exercise or sporting event, uh, the nature of the event needs to be considered. Variables from sport to sport or type of training matter when accurately assessing each. Uh, so for example, proper uh, conditioning for football is going to look different than conditioning for cross-country season. The way an athlete trains for each sport will impact their performance. So likewise, the demands of a sport will uh, force a specific response from caffeine. Recent research studies have uh, looked at the impact of caffeine on endurance sports by having athletes consume caffeine at different points in the event. Uh, before competition, spread out during the competition, or a mixture of the two. For reference, uh, these endurance sports and these studies include events that last one hour or longer. Uh, the best results have come from caffeine intakes as low as one and a half milligrams per kilogram of body weight. The benefits increased as the dose uh, increased in these studies, but topped out at three milligrams per kilogram of body weight, or between about 200 and 250 milligrams of caffeine. So the more is better philosophy uh, didn't hold true in these studies as performance actually declined when doses exceeded six milligrams uh, per kilogram of body weight. Another uh, variable was found by researchers at the Georgia Institute of Technology when they discovered that when caffeine and carbohydrates were both consumed uh, during exercise, uh, there was a small benefit compared with consuming carbohydrate alone. When caffeine supplements were used with water, there was a two-fold larger enhancement of performance uh, than when caffeine was consumed with carbohydrate. As far as uh, sustained high-intensity sports, um, those are defined as an event that lasts between you know, one minute and 30 minutes um, and include sports like rowing, swimming, uh, middle distance running, and cycling. Uh, because they're so short, the only option would be to consume caffeine prior to the event. So in most studies in this duration, six milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight have been used, uh, but evidence suggests that doses as low as three uh, milligrams per kilogram of body weight is, are just as effective. Now, a few questions have to be uh, answered for this category of sport or exercise like whether caffeine would be as effective in a subsequent event on the same day. Uh, for example, if a track and field athlete consumes caffeine and it benefits them on the first event of the day, uh, there's inconclusive evidence stating whether or not uh, it would still benefit from the next event. Um, think of this as maybe uh, a, a sprinter is competing in an event, um, say the 400 meter race, and then they might benefit from that initial caffeine dose, but unless they consume more caffeine, that same benefit isn't going to uh, still be in effect once they run the 4x4. Um, another concern is the overarousal and anxiety or jitter-like side effects that caffeine um, can have and the impact that those side effects would have on a skilled athlete. Now, in team and racket sports uh, that require short bursts of energy followed by a, you know, a slight downtime or even full recovery, uh, there was clear evidence of a benefit when caffeine was consumed in a pregame drink. Now, these sports are like uh, tennis, baseball, or softball, and volleyball. The primary benefit, according to research, is increased running speed and in focus and concentration when performing certain skills. 
As far as skill and performance are concerned, uh, there is potential for caffeine to enhance the performance of sports that rely heavily on skill. So some sports like golf might not fatigue muscles in the same way that football or running might, uh, but because of the length of time it takes to complete a round, athletes can feel both mentally and physically fatigued. This is where caffeine might be beneficial. However, long, uh, large intakes of caffeine should be limited or monitored because of symptoms like jitters and anxiety that might impair fine motor control in these events. Uh, as I've mentioned throughout this discussion, uh, there are side effects that everyone should take into consideration when consuming caffeine. Uh, caffeine intakes of up to 400 milligrams uh, spread throughout the day are not associated with any adverse effects in healthy adults. However, uh, there are well-known side effects including increased heart rate, small increases in blood pressure, anxiety, jitters, mental confusion, inability to focus, gastrointestinal unrest, insomnia, and irritability. While most studies have been done on adults, little research has been done on the effects of caffeine on children 12 and under. Uh, a lot of this is for ethical reasons, but health authorities caution kids to limit their caffeine intake to less than two and a half milligrams per kilogram of body weight uh, because of increased risk of behavioral side effects. Um, even if you are okay with consuming uh, caffeine at what might be an appropriate level for yourself, uh, always be sure to follow the guidelines of the organization that you are competing under. Uh, the NCAA has stimulants listed as a category in the banned substances list. Um, um, among the stimulants is listed uh, is caffeine. I know uh, many high school state organizations also have caffeine limits and regulations that are required in order to maintain eligibility. And the same holds true now for the World Anti-Doping Agency. Now, in addition uh, to the reasons I've already mentioned, athletes should monitor their caffeine intake for purposes of recovery, and sleep is at the top of that list. Caffeine has been shown to reduce total sleep time, increase the time taken to fall asleep, and change the quality of sleep by reducing the amount of time uh, spent in deep sleep. To understand this, it's important to know that there are five sleep cycles. So stage one is light sleep, um, during which it's, it's really easy to wake up. Uh, stage two takes up about 50% of the sleep cycle. Uh, this is when brain waves become slower. Stage three is the first stage of deep sleep where it can be difficult to wake up. Uh, stage four is the second stage of deep sleep. Um, now, if the individual reaches both stages of deep sleep, they will most likely wake up feeling refreshed. And the final stage is REM or rapid eye movement sleep. Now this uh, stage is associated with dreaming. As I said, uh, caffeine reduces total sleep time and the duration of uh, stages three and four, ultimately preventing the individual from feeling rested once they wake up. Now, if you remember at the beginning of this discussion, uh, I mentioned how caffeine affects uh, adenosine and virtually turns off signals telling our bodies that they should be tired. Uh, this is the same way that caffeine can negatively affect our sleep cycles. Our caffeine consumption uh, then becomes a never-ending cycle. You know, if we uh, don't feel rested in the morning, we'll lean on caffeine to help us stay awake so that we can complete whatever task we have for the day. And then if our caffeine consumption is too high, um, it will in turn cause us to miss out on sleep again that night, again, leaving us tired and fatigued the next morning uh, to continue that cycle of over-caffeine consumption. Uh, some studies have shown that caffeine affects sleep in a dose-response uh, manner, meaning that the effects increase with the size of the dose. Timing of caffeine consumption also matters. If taken right before bed, uh, caffeine might not alter the ability to fall asleep, uh, but if it's taken earlier with time for absorption and uh, time to increase blood caffeine concentrations, it's more likely to increase the time it takes to fall asleep. Now, one of the best examples of this that I can think of is the idea of nappuccinos. Um, if you've ever tried it, uh, you've probably felt the effects. A nappuccino is essentially where you consume caffeine right before taking a nap. Now, given the results of studies I just mentioned, uh, if you're already tired for your nap, you won't have trouble falling asleep despite just having consumed uh, caffeine. Um, if your nap lasts about 30 minutes, uh, you'll wake up refreshed from your nap and that is also about the time that the caffeine is being absorbed and taking effect. 
Now, remember at the very beginning of this talk, I mentioned that uh, caffeine typically enters the bloodstream anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes after ingestion. So, nappuccinos might not be for everyone, uh, but based on science and anecdotal evidence, um, it could be a good way to get in a nap and wake up feeling extra refreshed. So, the important thing to remember is that caffeine can increase alertness, focus, wakefulness, and can have a positive impact on performance. Uh, though further studies are needed to assess the complete impact caffeine can have, it is clear that there is an impact. Uh, caffeine is popular and perhaps the most used drug in the world. While it has many benefits, also uh, always keep in mind the negative effects that come with its consumption. The overall effects of caffeine can vary from person to person, so find what works for you. Uh, there's much more that can be said and discussed concerning caffeine, but I hope you're able to gain some information that will help you in the future. Um, maybe this has sparked some interest in learning more on your own. Um, additional studies and literature are certainly available and you can find more information in books like NSCA's Guide to Sport and Exercise Nutrition, uh, Caffeine for Sports Performance, and in our Human Kinetics journals where you can find research studies and more. You can find those at journals.humankinetics.com. Um, also say, if you're not already, make sure to like and follow our social media pages on Facebook and Instagram. Always subs uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to click that bell so that you get alerts when new videos are uploaded. And be sure to subscribe to our newsletters for regular content on niche areas like fitness and health, uh, strength and conditioning, and coaching. Uh, and be the first to know about special promotions and discounts. So, so thank you for joining me today for this uh, talk on caffeine. Hope you learned a lot for the future. And until next time, be well.